There we go. Uh, Mary, you can kick off whenever you're ready. Okay. Hi, I'm Mary Gabriel, and this is MLVC, the Madonna podcast. Hey, guys, I'm Tony. Welcome back. And hey, everybody, it's Stefan. Thanks for joining us for another episode of MLVC, the Madonna podcast, your place for all things Madonna Louise Veronica Ciccone. As you just heard today on the show, we are joined by author Mary Gabriel. Mary, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. I'm so thrilled to be here. Or oh. thrilled to have you. I um, Where are you podcasting from today? I'm in Gal County Galway, Ireland. Oh, very cool. Very yeah, far away. We are very, very close to London. Oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We're very excited to have you on the show. I mean, I've been kind of following you this entire, like the last month, actually, you've gotten some amazing press and you're just everywhere. Yeah, you've been on your very own Evita Rainbow Tour. Like you've you've been on Interview Magazine, The Atlantic, New York Times. I've seen you've been on fellow Madonna podcasts. So um, we're very happy that we were able to snag some of your busy press schedule. Oh, no, are you kidding? I mean, this is such a joy for me because... You know, it's hard with a subject like Madonna. It's not me people are interested in. Obviously, it's her. And so I'm just the conduit for all things Madonna at the moment when you two aren't there. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the same sort of thing. We, we do a show about Madonna. I'm like, people aren't listening for us. Yeah, they're they're yeah. listening for the Madonna goss. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tony, do you want to give a proper bio for Mary? Absolutely. It would be my pleasure. Mary Gabriel is the author of Ninth Street Women, Lee Krasner, Elaine de Kooning, Grace Hardigan, Joan Mitchell, and Helen Frankenthaler, Five Painters and the Movement That Changed Modern Art, which won the 2022 NYU Axon Foundation Prize for Narrative Nonfiction and the 2019 Library of Virginia and Virginia Museum of Fine Arts Mary Lynn Cotts Award. Gabriel's previous book, Loving Capital, Carl and Jenny Marx and the Birth of a Revolution, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Award, and the National Book Critics Circle Award. She's the author of Notorious Victoria, The Life of Victoria Woodhull, Uncensored, and The Art of Acquiring, a portrait of Etta and Clara Belcone. She worked in Washington and London as a Reuters editor for nearly two decades and lives in County Galway oh, well. in Ireland. <laughs> so, and welcome. of course, the reason why we have Mary on the show today is because of this enormous Madonna biography. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, as big as that is, it actually, when I turned it into my editor, it was nearly twice as long. It was 1500 pages because wow. there is so much to say about her, you yeah. know, and people say, oh, you know, this is exhaustive. This is this is the book. No, there's actually another one out there if someone's brave enough to do it. When you consider all the aspects of her career, you know, the fashion, the film, the video. I mean, it's just it's amazing what one woman has done in 40 years. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, Tony, why don't we kick off with some questions for Mary? Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, with no previous extensive knowledge of Madonna, how did you set about doing the research, five years worth, I must say, and uh, constructing the outline for the book? I mean, there are so many different angles you could hit it from. I mean, obviously, a chronological would be the, the one that made more sense, correct? Yeah. I, it's funny. I'm very conservative when, in my approach to biography because I feel as though people, you know, it's not that they're living a vertical timeline, you know, from birth to death, but they're living through waves of events and culture. And so if you take the people out of their timeline and out of the greater world, what's happening around them at that time, what they're doing doesn't make sense. And I think with Madonna, um, it's ex especially with an artist like Madonna, it's especially true because she is a sponge absorbing everything, you know, the people around her the art around her, the music around her, the film and the social events, you know, she's responding mm -hmm. all the time and incorporating that into her work. So the only way I, th I thought I could do it um, to have it make sense would be to just do it straight, you know, build her life the way she lived it. And I, the way, the reason I broke it down into kind of datelines or, or cities, you know, the first one is Michigan, second, New York, Los Angeles, Miami, and Lisbon is that London and then Lisbon is that, she really does change radically depending upon where she lives. And I think that helps readers and, and people understand her work much more clearly if they know what's happening around her. Yeah, it's almost like those are goalposts for- Exactly. You know, like... Yeah, yeah like I, in, mean, go ahead. I was gonna say in one of the lyrics to uh, one of her songs, she says, there's only so much you can learn in one place. And yeah. that's 
you know, that's very indicative of like how she has lived her life, like you say, in different places, different um, incarnations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And each time she grows. So just think of the radical change between her life in New York City as a raw street kid and then her move to Hollywood. You know, that would be head spinning. You know, she went to from a town where you could do anything, be anything. Nobody was passing judgment on you because nobody cared what you do because you were just an underground artist to Hollywood where the spotlight is literally always on and it's an industry town. Right. You have to stay, work within really prescribed borders. If you're a woman, you do what you're told. If you're gay, you stay in the closet. You know, mm -hmm. that was the opposite of what Madonna had known. But, you know, she she rolled with it and she became, mm -hmm. you know, a material girl and she became Hollywood. And it was really fun to watch, but it, it must have been fairly difficult transition for her. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was hilarious when she went from like a virgin uh, gypsy ragamuffin and then suddenly she's Jean Seberg and she's a Hollywood woman a wealthy woman you know yeah. with expensive tastes and I'm like wow it was always inside of her but now she's got the means right exactly exactly yeah uh, well so as we know there have been many unauthorized biographies written about Madonna over the years by several journalists closely associated with the genre what do you feel sets your book apart from those books that were written in the 90s? Mm -hmm. I think it's just that I approach her not as a celebrity, but as an artist and as a cultural figure. And I'm looking at her as a historian, as a cultural historian. So so I, I hope that my, um, you know, I'm not writing a longer version of the headlines that are written about her. Oh, my right. God, what's she doing? You know, what's her latest outrage? I really want to get in behind who is this woman who's changed all of our lives and and what she's saying. And so I, I try to spend as much time as I can on her actual work as I do on her life, you know, which is fantastic, of course, as we all know. But I really try to get into the work. And the other thing I try to do, which I think earlier books didn't do, and maybe they didn't have the space or they just weren't interested, I want to give the people around her a voice because, you know, um, she, the people she worked with were so unbelievable and they all had such contributions. You know, she's a collaborator. She's a collaborative artist. That's where she came from in New York. That's how they, everybody did it. You worked as a group, which is much more fun. And as she said one time, you know, maybe some people can be a genius alone, but you know, I'm not one of them, which is so wonderful to, to say and to be yeah. honest mm -hmm. like that. And so, because it is true, nobody's a genius alone. A film director does it because of all the people on the set. Um, so so I tried to give those people a voice. And I think when you hear them, you learn who they were and what they were saying about her and what they were saying about their own work. I think it really enriches the story. Yeah, agreed. I, yeah, I, I, I think it's, I mean, that's sort of what we had envisioned doing with this podcast was, mm. you know, telling the story of Madonna is not, you know, you can't do that without the people that she was working with. And mm -hmm. exactly, it, it's great to hear their perspectives on what was happening at that time. Exactly. And, you know, so much of her work, let's say, you know, in the 80s, I mean, C Seymour Stein said that the person who's been most neglected in all the books on Madonna is Martin Burgoyne. And yeah. it's absolutely true. I mean, if you look at indexes, he might get two mentions, you mm -hmm. know, and yet he was absolutely critical at the moment when Madonna was an embryo artist. Mm -hmm. You know, he not only was her sounding board, according to Seymour, but he inspired her in such a way and opened up literally opened up doors to her to the avant-garde world in new york city and mm -hmm. so i tried to bring him in as much as possible so there are those kind of people who helped you know she created herself but there are people along the way who influenced her in such a way that she wouldn't be the artist she is today if she hadn't known them yeah yeah, yeah it's well, so as a casual observer of Madonna and her career prior to writing this book, because you had said that you're, you weren't necessarily a Madonna fan prior yeah. to this, what did you learn about her that you didn't know before? Or like, what, what impressed you the most about Madonna? Yeah, well, I mean, the, one of the joys of writing this book was having to, was being forced to listen to Madonna for five solid years and, yeah. and also, you know, to look at all of her work. So that was, you know, a real eye opener for you, because as you say, I was not in any way a Madonna fan. I, you know, I knew of her, but I hadn't paid any attention to her music and or her any of her other work. And when I when I started watching it and and listening to it, I just was shocked at how talented she was and how much she's been misinterpreted. You know, mm -hmm. this pop star box that the world has put her in is so tiny and just 
you know, not does not represent at all the artist she really is. So that was the first big revelation to me. Um, secondly, you know, just her impact globally, not even just in the States, but globally, she has touched people in the darkest corners of the world and given them hope. And I think that's one of the things about her that's so that that um, has created this loyal fan base she has that she connects with people in this intimate way. And it, it's really kind of magical. And I her her one of her first managers, Camille Barbon, I guess it was her first manager, mm -hmm. had said that when she first saw Madonna, that's what she noticed that she's on stage and you can feel inside of her. She's offering herself to you. And that never stopped. She, in fact, in, the, in her concert last night in London, you know, she was doing it again. She was right there for that vast, uh, you know, that vast arena. Every single person in there thought she was singing to them because she's yeah. got that intimate connection. Yeah. So I was really impressed by her cultural reach and the importance that she's, the, and her importance globally on a cultural level. And then just her as a person, I mean, my God, her courage, you know, I've written about Karl Marx <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> he, I don't think he was as courageous as Madonna. In fact, I know he wasn't, you know, he was shriveled up in a little ball a lot of times because he couldn't stand the heat and she would throw herself out repeatedly, no matter what the backlash was. And I mean, what kind of strength does that take for a young yeah. woman who was nobody who came from nowhere with nothing, no prospects whatsoever? So, I mean, in that way, her story to me was remarkable. So on, on really every level, I came out of it. I went into it, not a fan, you know, intrigued enough to want to spend five years with her, but not mm -hmm. a fan. I came out of it, you know, a diehard Madonna fan. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> was it, I'm curious to know, I mean, cause that's such a gift to be given Madonna, like her exactly. entire 40 years in like all of a sudden, here you go. And you can just sort of enjoy it. You know, Tony and I, we've sort of grown up with, with her and she's been in our lives every year with the controversies and whatnot. Was it interesting to sort of look at her career and not be affected by the media scathing reviews that are happening while you're listening, you know, like erotica, you know, in the sex book and body of evidence, that was so much hatred towards Madonna. And you just sort of got to enjoy it without being influenced by any of that was how yeah. was that from looking at her career without any of that noise? Yeah, I think that that was so critical, because I have to tell you, the first version of this book I wrote, you know, it's went through many iterations, was a really angry book, because mm. I felt like I had to defend her all against yeah. all of this. Stuff. I mean, it's not my job to defend Madonna. My job is just to tell the story and let the reader decide what they think. But it it was so, she was so abused, you know, every step of the way. And then I, you know, rolled back and tried to distance myself from the story a bit so that I could tell ultimately that one, you know, from up here, the omniscient observer. Um, and and I hope that's what I managed to do. But it I think because I wasn't a fan. I didn't take everything personally and I didn't yeah. get bogged down in the headlines. You know, people have said, Oh, why don't you write about her, you know, cosmetic surgery or, you know, what she's been doing with her face, anti-aging stuff. And I, I mean, I actually don't care. You know, it's her face. Yeah. She can do what she wants to. It's her body, her face. Um, but I think if I were a fan, you know, a day-to-day -day fan, I would have responded to that more because I would have had more of a connection with her. So, so I think on the one hand, I think it was, better for me not being a fan going into this book. I could write a more objective book, even though I definitely do enjoy her. And I think that comes across in the book. Um, but I think I was able to just give a little bit of that journalistic distance or sure. historical distance. No, and you definitely did because I did not feel like it was fan service. You know, um, it, you know, it was, it, you know, it's like reading you know, a historical piece, which is exactly what her life is. Uh, one of the one of the things that really surprised me, and I and one of the things that I love about the book, is all the different voices from the interview subjects, um, because it offered. It, these were different from prior books or from um, you know Madonna uh, documentaries, because they seemed a lot more personal and they seemed to have come from a good place uh, as opposed to a place of criticism. Like, for example, it was surprising to read uh, actor Lawrence Monison's recollections of his relationship with Martin Burgoyne. I had no, no idea that they were a couple. I worked with him in 1994 on a TV movie that he was co-starring in, and we became really friendly and never once did I know he was gay or did he reveal his sexuality to me? So um, 
I didn't know any of these details until I read your book. How were you put in contact with him and any of the other interview subjects? And how did you uh, pitch to them what kind of um, what kind of story you were going to tell as opposed to, you know, um, you know, reaching for the scandalous parts of it? You know, yeah. it was really difficult. And I mean, maybe you two have experienced this, too, but it's really difficult to get people to talk about Madonna. Mm -hmm. um, any, I mean, people who matter, I was gonna, I was gonna ask actually, you about that a little okay, later. Okay, right. yeah, yeah, we know we can bring really, that up too. We can okay, good. Up. People who really know the story. So, so it took a lot of time, and but I think I think one of the things I tried to do is, um, you know, I had I had watched all of the interviews, the the kind of standard interviews of people who say the same things over and over. Get bless mm -hmm. their hearts for saying them, but you know, so I knew I didn't need to talk to those people. Um, so I tried to dig a little deeper and because I really wanted to describe Madonna's birthplace, artistic birthplace in New York city, I wanted to get some of those people who've never really been interviewed. Um, yeah. Like Marcus Leatherdale, you know, mm -hmm. who now sadly has passed away, but you know, he was so fantastic. He's the guy who introduced Madonna to Andy Warhol, you know, which is so yeah. fun. And he was really great because he met her through Martin Burgoyne and he didn't really know Madonna. And so he got, you know, he described getting to know her and coming to appreciate her. So he could talk about her from that perspective of, you know, a gay man watching her and his, his I couldn't, I didn't use all the quotes um, that he gave me, um, but, you know, some of them were really fun and outrageous. And it was basically, you know, about Madonna's just absolute lack of inhibition as far as sexuality went, which was so unusual really for a young woman in those days, even a young woman in that circle. And so he was great. He told me about Lawrence Monison because um, he was so close to Martin. And he said that, you know, that Lawrence was really the only guy Martin had ever said, this is my boyfriend. And so I knew I had to track him down. And he was really gracious and wonderful talking to me. You know, it's a very personal thing. And and, yeah. and it's funny, I could still feel his pain, you know, that the choices he had to make as a young actor, when he knew his lover was dying in New York, and he's in Mexico making a movie, and he can't go there, because if he said he was going to see his boyfriend, that was the end of his acting career, you know, right. which would have been true 20 years later. Sure. So yeah, it was really moving, and, and I could still hear his pain, and and he was really great. And I think it's such a beautiful love story. It's like a love story, you know, at the end of time, you know, at the at during the AIDS crisis when people were just literally dying and Martin was sick. And he, that's the moment he meets the man, you know, he's in love with. And, oh, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. So so that was really a great connection. And then Catherine Underhill was another New York person who's never really spoken before. And I think I connected with her through Marcus as well, because um, she was the other Martin Burgoyne's other best friend and she was there at his bedside when he was dying and she was also there with madonna through all the danceateria stuff um through her you know earliest performances and so she could talk as as um you know as a real eye on madonna from those early days as opposed to a lot of people who are at the clubs and might have seen madonna from a distance but they weren't really her friends and maybe they didn't really like her and so they said just kind of snarky things about her Catherine wasn't, you know, a huge booster of Madonna's, you know, I think she probably had some issues with her, but she could talk about who she actually was as a person and, and how she developed in those first performances she gave. So they were mm -hmm. really fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Were you able to see uh, footage from last night when Madonna performed Live to Tell and she I did was that? just watching that before I talked to you. Oh, oh, my God. The most immense tribute to the, those in her life, in her right. orbit that she lost to AIDS from, um, you know, Christopher, her dance instructor. And then, you know, the the huge photo of Martin Burgoyne just tore Beautiful. my heart out I because I don't think she's ever been that, you know, forthcoming with with that personal part of her life and mm -hmm. Keith Haring as well. Right. So it's yeah. a, a fitting tribute. And um, yeah, it's it's always that been was, there, but this is now out there, you know? You know, isn't it? And we can talk about the concert later, but I, I just, I mean, that that whole section was just so, it was such a wonderful piece of autobiographical musical theater, not, mm -hmm. not a pop yeah. concert at all. It's a new genre. Once again, yeah. we're getting from her, you know, and that seeing this, those images scroll down while she's singing that song, or she starts the segment with, in this life, you know, yeah. oh my yeah. God. And also just ending holiday with the dancers dropping dead on the floor. 
That's yeah. what happened to that era. It ended because death killed it. You know, I mean, yeah. AIDS killed it. And and there's just no pretty way to tell that story. There's no, you know, that's what happened. It was a tragedy. And so I, I really, I haven't seen the rest of the concert yet, but I, that's where I stopped. And it was so honest and beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually, she, um, I don't know if you had seen on online the she worked with the AIDS Memorial Foundation to produce that oh, tribute. Good. They actually they were instrumental in helping provide the images for those backdrops, like the non celebrities. Oh, so I I was like, good for her. See, she's still, you know, she's been an ally. She still continues to be right. an ally. You know, it's right. um. I I wanted to loop in since we were talking about it. You had mentioned in previous interviews you were unable to speak to people in Madonna's mm -hmm. life who knew her and worked with her like Erica Bell or Debbie mm -hmm. Mazar mm -hmm. we've encountered the same problem doing mm -hmm. the podcast so I was when I heard that I was like oh well good to know we're not the only <laughs> yeah. ones who run yeah. into that issue mm -hmm. who were the top three people from Madonna's entire life that you would have wanted to interview mm -hmm. for the book that you weren't able to speak to yeah well Madonna <laughs> um, <laughs> and that was you know that was five years of knocking on closed doors, Same. but you know what, Same. that's all right. I can understand. You know, um, I would have liked to have talked to Liz Rosenberg. Um, yeah. you know, she, first of all, because I know she can be so, she's such a great storyteller. And also, I mean, she was there through everything, you know? Yeah. So she would have been really fun to talk to. And also I kind of would have liked to talk to Guy O'Siri, which is a little bit of a strange choice, but on the music side of things, it would have been nice to hear his side of the story because he had, you know, he would point Madonna in certain directions. You know, why don't you talk to this person? You know, I mean, from William Orbit, you know, to today. And yeah. so he would have been a really, I think, interesting interview. Um, yeah. Because, you know, all of his steers weren't great. I mean, I, I had, you know, I have a little bit of trouble with the whole Justin Timberlake Timberland, you know, although I know some people really love that album, but, that was a steer he did. And, but I, I think it would have been really fun to talk to him. So, but I mean, really, I would have talked to anybody, you know, anybody who would have spoken with me. No, you're think, right. Cause it's interesting with uh, Guy Oziri because he met Madonna when he was 18 years old and he, kid, you could say yeah. in a sense, he was raised by her, you know, and, exactly. and now he's kind of like a parental figure for her, which mm -hmm. is kind of like an odd switch, mm -hmm. but you know, that's the way life is. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was like her little brother. And now yeah. the little brother is the the parent, as you say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Rain, raining her in. Don't do this. Mm -hmm. yeah. do, do, make sure do you do this. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Mary, were you at all surprised by the dedication and enthusiasm that Madonna's fans <laughs> generate? Like, what what do you think of the enduring fandom? Uh, I mean, you know, people like Tony and I. I mean, it's been since Madonna came out. We've yeah. been yeah. fans, and how do you what do you make of that? <laughs> well. First, I'll answer in a, not about the fans, but from her point of view. I mean, I think that the I know that Christopher, her brother, told me this, that it was I asked him one time with, you know, during the whole sex and erotica period, you know, which was so horrible. So how did she survive that? And he said it was the fans. You know, it was as simple as that. They're the ones who pulled her through. And she was able to focus on her fans rather than this chattering class, you know, that would mm -hmm. criticize everything she did. So. So. You know, on her side, there's a loyalty to you, to all of you, because you pulled her through. It's kind of like a joint effort. You know, yeah. she feeds you and you feed her. Yeah. And as far as her loyal fan base, I mean, I was, I I had never really encountered anything like that. I know that fan bases exist, but I think with her, it's something different because as I said before, there's an intimacy there and it's almost a familial kind of thing, you know, you grew up with her. She grew up with you. You've watched, well, you, she hasn't watched you make mistakes, but you've watched <laughs> her make mistakes. You've watched her kind of, you know, become different people. And maybe you weren't thrilled with all of them, but you stuck with her. And I think that, I think that's what it is that she, she's just, um, she just inspires loyalty because she invites you into her life. And, and it's such a fascinating life and it changes so much that you want to be there, you know, to see what happens next. How can you take your, how can you take your, your eyes off that picture? You can't. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. no. I, I was going to say, so in the 80s, her work and success empowered her young female fans to be bolder, more expressive in spite of what society expected them to be or what they had encountered before in pop music. Um, at the same time, this was bubbling under with her gay fans at a time when this fan base was not well defined outside of gay spaces. Um, you know, when I was growing up, it, I you know, kind of had to pull it back a little bit, but all, all my girlfriends were big fans of like a virgin and true blue. And, you know, I felt a certain way because I couldn't be as open about my love for Madonna as they were, you know? So, um, until, you know, erotica, uh, sex, all these things kind of emboldened a whole new generation of yeah, a blonde of ambition. Blonde mm -hmm. Ambition, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was, uh, you know, as I told uh, Luis Extravaganza, it was the first time that I ever saw gay, Latino, uh, Black, uh, all, all, you know, just gay men on stage doing what they want to do without restrictions, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So what can you say about the evolution and revolution of her fan base during a time of AIDS and rampant homophobia? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It did It did start with, you know, she she awakens undergrounds and I, I always think of her first underground as that vast, those girls in their suburban bedrooms, you know, who were tied up into little balls told, mm -hmm. you know, basically you can look forward to being a wife and a mother and maybe have a career, but don't take it too seriously. And God forbid, you know, don't express your sexuality. And that's her, that was her first yeah. audience. And that's who she first awakened. But I think that um, by 85, 80, no, let's say, yeah, 85, 86, when at a really critical moment, when the when AIDS was finally percolating to the international consciousness, you know, it had been suppressed for so long, just talking about it. Um, I think that's when she realized she had to start making statements, you know, statements in support of people with AIDS, statements in support of gay people, statements, of, even statements in support of lesbians, although I think they didn't start so much until sex. Yeah. But um, so so mid 80s was when I think she really started focusing on her gay fan base. And, and I think it was partly in response to AIDS, but partly because she was losing her best friends at that moment, you know, and these mm -hmm. were all kind of love letters to them. So when I think about, I don't know if you remember in the, my book where I talk about Cherish, that video, yeah. that she, her the first one she did with Herb Ritz, um, his first video, he had just discovered that month that he was HIV positive. Mm -hmm. And I never quite understood that video because it's so sweet and, you know, maternal and there's a warmth about it. And it's just kind of an odd moment for her then. We often think of open your heart as this, as this, I do anyway, as the moment when she's embracing the gay community on in video, but Cherish mm -hmm. is the next one. And, and that's, she's talking to Herb, you know, you can't get away. I won't let you. Oh my God. Yeah. It's so heartbreaking. Mm. And to think that, you know, he's making this work of beauty at a moment when he's finding, you know, he just found out that he's probably going to die. So, yeah. um, and I think then when she gets into, after her marriage with Sean Penn, you know, ends, then she could really focus on the gay community. And that's what she does through um, Blonde Ambition, you know, um, Truth or Dare, Sex, Erotica, Justify My Love, Vogue, you know, Vogue. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, these statements are so profound, especially when you think, that the narrative at that moment about gay men was about death. You know, mm -hmm. society yeah. was happy enough to talk about gay men who were dying, but they didn't want to talk about gay men who were alive and beautiful and joyous. And she said, these are my friends. This is what they do. Here they are. And, you know, and as you say, I can imagine young men around the world seeing these blind ambition dancers out there, proud, gorgeous, on the biggest stage in the world. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a statement that is. So mm -hmm. so I think that that was really her second big social moment, you know, where she literally changed the world with what she was saying. First, it was with young women. Second, was, yeah. it was with gay men. Yeah, what, what you just um, expressed is, it takes me back to that moment when she left her husband to go to New York to do Speed the Plow. And then yeah. she was back in New York as a star and working with Howard Bruckner, who died of AIDS shortly after their film yeah. wrapped and uh, becoming friends with Sandra Bernhard. And it it was kind of like a departure from the bubble she was in living with her husband in Malibu. And and yeah, I think that's when she, she really just started to take off and say, I'm going to do what I want to do, regardless of what people want me to do. 
I think you're absolutely right. And I think also, if you can imagine having worked with David Mamet, you know, Mr. Macho, and then Warren Beatty on Dick Tracy, which, you know, by all, everything I've read, that set was just so misogynistic. Oh, and yeah. Horrible. So then, you know, she goes to New York and she's back with her friends and she's working, you know, with um, Chef Pettibone on, you know, erotica and, and or on Vogue, on the song Vogue yeah. after Dick Tracy. Oh, my God. She must have felt so liberated. So, yeah. I think that's actually, absolutely. She burst out of that Hollywood madness and became herself again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's chapters in your book that talk about Madonna coming of age in the East Village, honing her craft, collaborating with the other emergent outsider artists during this very specific time and place. I mean, we'll never have that, you know, East Village in the late 70s, early 80s again. Tell us what you think about her drive to succeed at any cost, why she's one of the few of that time to still be around when so many of her contemporaries did not make it um, due to, you know, the circumstances, AIDS, drugs, um, you know, this was the most formative time for her. Yeah, I think, you know, she's she's got a real survivor's instinct. And I, mean, I think that was from, you know, from her heartbreak when her mother died, you know, her childhood trauma turned her into a little survivor. And, and so I think, you know, people around her, Catherine Underhill talked about how everybody at Danceteria knew she was really ambitious. And for some people, ambition was a really dirty word. Mm -hmm. But and even though Madonna was probably very aware of that, um, she really didn't care. And that's why she liked Keith Haring so much, because he was also accused of the same thing, that he was overly ambitious, that he was commercial, you know. But it's commercial in the Andy Warhol sense of the term, where it's pop art, you know. If you, mm -hmm. it's not high, it's not low, it's not, you know, just for this little elite group, it's for everybody. Let's bring everybody to the party. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so I think that's, I think she, one, just had a drive that most people, a superhuman drive that most people don't have, you know, that could take her from point, from zero to, you know, superstardom in about a matter of a couple of years. And, and I think also she's always known how to take care of her, her health. Yeah. I mean, she's really understands that this body she has is an instrument that needs to be protected and taken care of. And that's why I think when she was sick this past summer, it was so shocking to all of us because yeah. that was the first time that she had gone too far with something external. You know, she, she introduced something into her body that hurt her and that was very unusual for her. So I think that that's really the difference. She's, she was very careful all of her life to take care of herself and she just has a drive that, you know, you can call it, you can call it ambition. You can call it just the drive of an artist, you know, her need to create um, exceeds every other need she has, you know, and it's been the reason why her marriages haven't worked. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a lot of her relationships because she just needs to be out there creating. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm curious what your thoughts are on Madonna's enduring legacies, you know, so, there's been pop stars that have followed after her due to her, you know, and she's had such an imprint on pop music as a whole. What do you, what do you think about like her effect on popular culture? Yeah, I think it's, it, she changed everything. You know, she made, she made it possible for, you know, the Beyonce's and the Taylor Swift's, no matter what you think of, you know, what's happened to their careers for them to be, because Madonna was the first pop artist to fill arenas internationally, to be her own creator. She wrote her songs, she produced her songs, she ran her business, she was Madonna Inc. Um, instead of having a team of, you know, white men, pardon me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, straight white men behind her telling her what she can say and do. She did it herself and she told them what she was going to do, whether they liked it or not. And I think that she knocked down, she didn't just open doors, she knocked down doors throughout her career that the pop artists today are free. If there's any freedom um, in being in, in the pop world, it's because of her. And and I think that um, the other thing is, is that uh, she, yeah, the whole idea of sexuality, it was really great. I mean, and obviously necessary because I won't get into this, but it's been a that's been an issue that's plagued feminists since the mid 19th century. But Madonna kind of put that, put that issue to rest, you know, but women are sexual, they can present as sexual any way they want, anytime they want, that's her choice. But unfortunately, one of the negatives of Madonna's influence on the industry is that that became a marketable skill, let's say, let's call it a skill that then the Hollywood and the entertainment 
powers that be really corrupted. And so for a while, let's say in the 90s, I think it was probably worse in the 90s, it really became distorted. And um, mm-hmm. and I think that uh, it was fairly out of control. But she's just like, you know, any any avant-garde artist or any philosopher or anyone who's who's way ahead of her time, you can deliver a message, but you can't control how it's going to be received and what's right. going to happen to it. And so I think there was a downside to her influence as well. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. When you were talking about that early part of the 90s, that's when they, you know, like they did with all the pop stars, like staying, you know, all those artists, you know, suddenly they had to be in films. And Madonna was kind of shoehorned to be, you know, an actress, but it was like she didn't have a choice in the matter. It was like the studio studio system wanted her to be this, wanted her to be that. And that's why there were so many hit and misses, I feel like, in at least that part of her career when it came to being an actress. Um, can you say anything about that, you know, about yeah. that? Yeah, I think it's really funny because, you know, I think her first love is actually film. I mean, I think mm-hmm. that that's, that's really where her heart is and i and i've actually thought about this the last few days um you know i think that you're absolutely right whenever she did a movie because she felt maybe pressure she had to do something in that you know in that genre it didn't work whenever she had a male director who thought that he knew better than she did it didn't work Mm -hmm. um but i think the other thing that didn't work is that when you think about it her best movies are the ones where she's both and and this goes to videos where she's got music and acting Mm -hmm. you know where you get the whole package madonna when there's music and acting and so when you think about desperately seeking susan it wasn't in any way a musical but music was a big part of it you know you just so that worked because she could actually be herself there she you know Mm -hmm. her whole self and then um you go to um evita you know that worked because it was all music but but things like body of evidence, you know, she can't fit into that that weird box that Hollywood was creating in those times, that basic instinct box where, you know, yeah. the horrible career woman who always has a gallery, you know, there are so many <laughs> galleries run by women. I mean, yeah. you know, it just makes me crazy when I see that. But, um, you know, so so it's just that she was really shoehorned into a lot of stupid roles. And mm-hmm. and then, of course, when the films didn't work, there was always her failing. So. Um, yeah. It was, it's unfortunate because I think she's probably a really, really tremendous actor. It's just that she didn't yeah. have the right, the right roles. Yeah. I mean, it, it remains, you know, it just, it's very evident, self-evident that when she does her best work in film, it's with female directors, you know, yeah. or, or, with or mu- in video. Yeah. 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 In video, if she's working with a man, a male director like David Fincher in a video, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, maybe it's because they respect her more in that situation because she has she knows so much more about music than they do. Yeah. So so it's more of a balance. It's more of a co-production. That could be. Exactly. But, I always um, wished we would have gotten a feature film with Fincher and Madonna. Oh, can you imagine? Mm-hmm. Like, you, I you mean, know, like Bad Girl is basically that. Exactly. You know, it's, it's like and we we had said that we reviewed uh, Body of Evidence as part of our Madonna Summer movie series this year. And we had thought, you know, she did body of evidence. And then she was like, this isn't turning out the way that I want to let's do uh, a redo. And she did bad girl, the video, you know, it was like within five minutes, they were able to accomplish a much more well-rounded character in that video than a two hour movie with body of evidence. Right. I know. I know she wasn't a cliche, you know, she, she she could have been because it was that whole looking for Mr. Goodbar story, but it wasn't a cliche. You know, it's funny too about David Fincher because not too long ago I watched Seven again, mm. and there was and he did that right after Bad Girl, and there were so many things visually in Seven that were born in Bad Girl. It was totally. really fun. Yeah. 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 So yeah, on that note, what do you think about uh, her musical, artistic, literary influences? How she's woven them into her work through the years? Yeah. For example, in Bad Girl, I see Clute. I see Looking for Mr. Goodbar. I see Wings of Desire. You know. Yeah. But how does this differ from appropriation, as her critics have accused her of doing throughout her career? You know, for it, another way to attack her. You know. Yeah. I mean, that whole appropriation thing is right up there um, with women gallery owners for me in the, in the <laughs> annoying category. Because, you know, I've written about artists and all artists appropriate. I mean, you do not learn 
you do not grow in your field unless you mm -hmm. look at what people did before you let that seep into you and then you transform it and it becomes something new that's just called artistic creation and when she does so-called appropriate like with vogue she's celebrating you know she it's not like she's saying oh i discovered this she's allowing the people who are the artists who did discover this or who are involved in it be part of it and she champions them and she yeah. does that consistently so so i have no i have no truck with the people who say you know she's just appropriating she's stealing from the underground no, she's introducing us to the yeah. underground. She's a host. Mm -hmm. You know, she's saying, look what I found. Wow, isn't this great? Look at this is the people who do it. Isn't this wonderful? And and I think that when you, I, I'm sure that through the years, people will write more and more books about her because there's just so much more to say. But, you know, whether it's her videos or her albums or her concerts, there are so many levels of material that go in there. And it's like a it's like a game that you can play. You know, how many can you identify? You know, in mm -hmm. her Madame X tour, there were so many things in there. Like I talk about in the book, you know, the backdrop um, to Papa Don't Preach, where is this, this Renaissance painter named Artemisia Gentileschi, who was mm -hmm. really one of the most profound painters of the Renaissance. But of course, because she was a woman, she wasn't recognized. And she painted this painting uh, about a rape. And it was the first time a woman that we know of had painted rape from a woman's point of view. So it wasn't about, you know, this kind of ravaging, you know, yeah. ravishment. It was the pain and the fear. And so that's what Madonna used with Papa Don't Preach. And now, I mean, what pop star would do that? You know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. None. I mean, as a teenage fan, I couldn't help but, you know, Madonna was a vessel for me to discover Frida Kahlo, um, yep. Tamara de Lempica, uh, and Sexton, you know, these are things that I picked up in interviews or just in the, you know, in the iconography, mm -hmm. but these are things that I probably wouldn't have had the understanding for until I was in college or maybe, you know, as, a, as an adult. So, I mean, I never thought of it as appropriation. I thought it was like, she is showing us what inspires her and she mm -hmm. is hoping that we get inspired by that through mm -hmm. her, you know? Mm -hmm. and, sure. Yeah. And you know how she's always said she she would have liked to have been a teacher, maybe if she hadn't, you know, yeah. and in a way she is a teacher because yeah. she's giving, a, you know, through her work, she's giving you a lesson and great that you actually picked up on that and follow through and looked at it. Because if that's if you did that, then then she did her best job. You know, that's what mm -hmm. she that's what she wanted to do. Yeah, yeah well, she, exactly. I mean, growing up as a high school student, you know, I lived in white suburban America, I wasn't able to go to a nightclub and understand what mm -hmm. voguing was, but mm -hmm. she put it on MTV mm -hmm. and suddenly I'm voguing everywhere I could, you yeah. know, <laughs> it's like white suburban America got to see yeah. this 15 year old kid voguing and they were like, yeah. what is he doing? You know? Yeah. Right. And, and also the bedtime story video, which referenced so many female artists and it's like people watch that video and they're like, this is so revolutionary. I'm like, but look behind the screen, you know, yeah. there is, so, there's a wealth of information just in that video right there, you know? Exactly. And, you know, when Mark Romanek, and I don't, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing his name correctly. I've never heard it, but I've just read it, um, talks about that process, you know, that he went into it with her knowing she has this deep knowledge of art history. Mm -hmm. And he went into it with her looking for female surrealists and, you know, it's like an art history course, that yeah. video. And in fact, it and that video ended up in the Museum of Modern Art, you know, yeah. archives. So, I mean, that's, but, you know, the Madonna haters and detractors in this world, the ones who just blow her off with a sentence, mm -hmm. have no idea what they're talking about. I have no idea about this artist. And, you know, one of my, one of the things I tried to do, and part of the reason why my book is 800 pages is that. I wanted to introduce that other Madonna, you know, the Madonna that you know, and that I now know to these people, hopefully who are open enough to actually try to, you know, recognize who she really is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, while we're on the subject of talking about art, because I love this part mm -hmm. of, of her life. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, with all the research that you've done and uh, people that you've spoken to, including Christopher Ciccone, what kind of a glimpse did you get into her art collection which I think is is one of the she's one of the most astute art collectors I've ever read about you know yeah yeah she has incredible stuff oh my god Vince Aletti um, who writes primarily about art and photography and stuff told me that when he went he interviewed her for Ar Aperture magazine and mm. I don't know I think it might have been in the early 90s I think it was when she was living in Oriole Way 
um, <laughs> he said that um, he was astounded by her art collection because it was so idiosyncratic. And, you know, he said she had a Salvador Dali. Now, Salvador Dali is kind of one of these artists that you've seen a zillion, probably not even. In real. every college dorm with the exactly. melting clock or the yeah. stairs. Yeah. Or, you know. He said he said she had the most unbelievable self Salvador Dali he had ever seen. And, you know, she had and he also said that she had people advising her on collecting, but that ultimately it was always like her work. It was always Madonna's choice. And it's not just that she said yes, no, or whatever. It had to speak to her. And so this overall collection had had a continuity to it, even if it was a Picasso and a Fernand Leger or a Tina Modetti photograph or whatever. It wow. all kind of worked because it all looked like it had kind of, you know, come out of Madonna's brain or out of her imagination. Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't that be fantastic to see an exhibition of her, the oh, work she owns? Amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I Anything have the feeling there? we'll probably get that many years. Yeah, down yeah, the yeah. Road, yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, and, and speaking of her art collection, uh, uh, one of the people in her life that uh, would source art for her would be her brother, Christopher Ciccone, mm -hmm. who famously wrote a book about his sister that was not at all well received. Um, I found it to be very revealing, but mm -hmm. uh, in your conversations with Christopher, how do you feel his stance toward his sister has, has changed since publishing his memoir? And um, how would you, I don't know, how would you speculate their relationship is currently? Well, I, you know, first of all, I didn't think that book was, I know a lot of fans were offended by it. I didn't think it was offensive. I thought, you know, it was fine. I mean, it was his version of their life and he's a kind of funny, acerbic guy and that's how he wrote. So, mm -hmm. um, and he didn't do it in any way to, you know, we talked a lot about that book and he didn't do it in any way to be offensive to her or it, he said it wasn't an I hate Madonna book, you know, quite the contrary. But, um, but I think that his, you know, he, he, I interviewed him, I think about five times and we just went through his entire life as a child and beside her, you know, through up until the two thousands with the entrance of Guy Ritchie in her life. And so it was just another nice perspective on what was going on. Um, and he was really somebody like Martin Burgoyne, who has gotten short shrift in her story because yeah. he was there, another sounding board, another, you know, person to keep her sane and you know to be there for personal and artistic support and you know he was the art director for blonde ambition which is an unbelievable statement and he was the director for um the girly show tour yeah. so you know he wasn't he wasn't just a back you know back door or a, a kind of a back bench player in her story he was right there so he was really generous in helping me understand all of that and their relationship i mean I don't know how much he sees her. I know that he loves her and I know that they talk, you know, he said they were talking again. Good. So, you know, I don't know. It's, it's funny because I look at Rocco and I think, Oh my God, he looks just like Christopher. You know, <laughs> he's kind of like a, a mix between, and I wish that it'd be really great if they have a relationship and, you know, I don't know if they do or not, but. I mean, they're both artists in their own right. Exactly. Speaking of art. Yeah. He, he exactly. does wonderful paintings. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's what Christopher was primarily uh, an artist. Yeah. I venture to say that they are speak on speaking terms because if you notice in the new merch drop, uh, there is a like a prayer T-shirt with uh, the cover art from the single, which was done by Christopher. Oh, good. So, um, you know, they've had to have well, had a ho conversation. Hopefully he's, hopefully he's getting a cut of that <laughs> merchandise. <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah. Um, hey, Stefan, is it time for my favorite part of the podcast? It is, but I actually I wanted to ask one. So before before we get to that, let's talk about celebration tour. So oh yeah yeah. Uh, so yeah. your book doesn't go all the way up until current day Madonna. I'm curious, will we see a second edition of? <laughs> yeah, of, the paper of, the, the paperback maybe an expanded yeah, really edition. Maybe maybe the paperback. I hadn't thought of that. Oh, my editor would die if I said I'd like to add pages. <laughs> 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 oh my god. <gosh. laughs> um. I don't know. I mean, that's an interesting idea. I had to stop it somewhere, you know. Yeah. And I and I saw Madame X in London, and so I because I started the book at with the Brixton two thousand performance. I thought the it was a nice arc to end it with Madame X in London. Yeah. yeah. Um. So so I had to do that. I mean, I couldn't keep following, and you know, there was so much that happened in twenty twenty after I officially ended, um, after that tour that I would have loved to have put in. But anyway, but 
maybe I'll, maybe I'll add celebration because I mean, it's such a fantastic tour. And in a funny way, it's a theatrical production of her life story. So it's yeah. kind of like the stage version of the book. Yeah. I was curious. So what we theorized, you know, we knew she was writing that biopic uh, for um, to be a movie, but we had always said, we thought it would be much better served as like a series like the crown where yeah. it's sort of focusing on every 10 years or so yeah. through her life. And I just thought, you know, reading your book, even how you sort of like divided it up in the sections, I was like, this would totally work as a Netflix yeah. special. I mm -hmm. can't imagine how you could tell her whole life. I don't, maybe she wouldn't tell the whole life. Maybe it would just be the early life, you know, the New York part in a film because you cannot squeeze all that information no. and do any, do it justice. If you, you give such a superficial treatment, I mean, even as it is, I had to cut so much of analysis of her work and, and there's, you know, I had to cut, there's some things I regret, like the Joey Buttafuoco Saturday Night Live, you know, event with tearing and, you know, that's so Fight much the more real enemy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's so much, that's a, such a more, much more complicated episode than people remember it as, you know, they see it as her dissing Sinead O'Connor, but it wasn't at all. It was about her coming to the defense of Amy Fisher, who everybody talked about, like she was the brains behind this murder yeah. attempt, you know, so it's it's a really interesting and very important moment, but you know I had to cut. But anyway, so yeah, I think you're absolutely right. As a series, it would work beautifully, mm -hmm. and who could stop watching that? I mean, oh, oh I mean, my God. oh, and just even the way that they do the crown, where it's like mm -hmm. a different cast every couple exactly. of seasons. I was like, they could have a different Madonna every and that's every decade. Very, it would be amazing. Exactly, yeah. that would be so important. I thought of that too. Did you ever see the? the Bob Dylan movie that Kate we've, Blanchett we've said in. that exactly yeah. where it's like different people are playing yeah. even men it works people, you know yep. yeah yeah I, I think yeah. it'd be fantastic but back to celebration I mean that that concert to me looks like it is just so unbelievable and you know what struck me most about it and I've only watched a little bit of it so far and I hope to see it um, either in the states or Europe but um, it's so radical you yeah. know you know how the concerts that are being done now that are kind of like the be, the stepchildren of the concerts Madonna did earlier, you know, that's all the razzle dazzle on the acts and the sparkly costumes and the dance acts. She is still so politically radical. The people she has on her stage are, 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 are I don't know how it's going to be received in the United States, you know, with the way the tide is turning against trans people and the mm -hmm. LGBTQ community. I really wonder how it's going to be received because this is a major political statement at this mm -hmm. tender moment. And I think that's really brave and, and typical of her, but really great. Yeah, I'm, I'm no, excited you, to see it as well. Yeah, because I feel like as opposed to, for example, the Madame X tour, this is going to bring back a lot of her old fans. And it's 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 going to rattle a lot of cages, especially, you know, I know that uh, the Tennessee show, the one in Nashville is planning to be a, um, a fundraiser for you know, the anti-trans bill that's mm. going to be passed there. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely going to um, inspire a lot of talk, you know, and, and that's definitely. good. That's, that's what she wants. And that's, that's what know. she does. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, as Tony alluded, it's time for a little segment we like to call the lightning round. <laughs> These answers are just meant to be quick off the top of your head, wherever okay. you're at in your Madonna journey today. Don't think too hard. Okay. Favorite Madonna song. Where life begins. Oh, oh yeah, interesting. I love that. Yeah. Uh, favorite Madonna album. Oh, that is really impossible. Um, can I give a couple? Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, I'll say Erotica, Bedtime Stories, um, Confessions on the Dance Floor, Rebel Heart, and Madam X, and that's that's the short list. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I just got chills because I love all of those too, and they all have like a like a thread that goes through them too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, favorite Madonna music video. Oh, you are real. This is so cruel. Uh, <laughs> um, I would have to say maybe, maybe Vogue and Justify My Love. Mm. Two very different. Yeah. But which yeah. came back to back, which I always thought was so fascinating. Uh, favorite Madonna tour. Mm. I have to say as much as I really loved Madame X and as much as I loved mdna for what it was politically which was so important i mean mm -hmm. wild and artistically i thought it was fantastic i still have to say blonde ambition because as a cultural marker that was yeah, yeah. really really uh, and no one's even approached it yeah favorite madonna movie 
Oh, God. Well, I guess it's, I'd have to say, can I say one is Madonna in front of the camera and one behind the camera? I really loved, of course, it has to be Desperately Seeking Susan. Yeah. But um, I really loved We. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. We was so underrated. I hope it's re released because it is a fantastic movie. Yeah. And if it, it is. hadn't been by Madonna, people would have loved it. Yeah, it would have been great in the art house theater. Exactly. You know, like people, if, yeah, exactly. Her name, had she ghost ghost directed it, people right. would have been like, this is wonderful. And, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, favorite Madonna look. And this can be from a video, a tour, a mm-hmm. photo shoot. Oh, God. Okay. Um, I loved her um, like a prayer look because it was Madonna, you know. Mm-hmm. It was real Madonna Ciccone. Um, and again, you know, I could give you every decade, there could be a three, three, three looks that I loved. But, you yeah. know, recently in the tw- 2020, I really loved, she did a photo shoot where she dyed her hair pink or she wore a pink wig and she was wearing black leather. Oh my God, she was so stunning. Mm-hmm. So, And you know what? I also really love the photo shoot she did. Um, blame it on Rio. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh my God. So great. Yeah. So. Pink, pink Donna is a personal favorite of mine. I love yeah. it. I love that she did that and then it came back again. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Mary, we also recreated the pink Donna look. Um, during- <laughs> <We did>. oh. <laughs> yes, we did. We loved it so much. One of our, 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 the, the, the podcast hairstylist, uh, oh. Michael Angelo, he get, donned us all with pink wigs and we oh, did a wow. photo shoot. It was oh. fantastic. I yeah, bet. in the middle of COVID, we went on a rooftop <laughs> in Hell's Kitchen and took some photos. It was it was just what we needed at that time, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. As so, a matter of fact, I just yeah. let me interrupt for one second. I want to say yeah. something else about celebration. When you said just what we needed at that time, this tour is just what we need at this time. Yes. Because yes. it is so joyous. And mm-hmm. good God, you know, in this grim planet, on this grim planet Ugh. at this moment, we need that party. So yeah, that's another thing that's good. About. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, that needs to be said. Um, can you please tell us what upcoming projects you're working on? Or are you taking a break right now? I am definitely taking a break. I don't good have a word. <laughs> I don't have a word in my veins. I, I, I am so tapped out. And besides, you know, I just want to enjoy, you know, what what I've, you know, not what I've done, but what I've experienced, you know, mm-hmm. I just kind of need mm-hmm. to let it settle in a bit. Sure, of course. Well, yeah, but we want to thank you for this book, because if I'm just speaking for myself, but this book is a gift. I mean, this is like, I think the definitive Madonna biography, because it speaks to her artistry, and it, it doesn't, you know, we're not spending a lot of time talking about ex-husbands, we're talking about who she is, where she came from, and how she affects us as as an artist and as a human being, you know, mm-hmm. so thank you for that. Oh, well, it was absolutely my pleasure. And as you as you said earlier, you know, to just say, OK, I'm going to spend five years with Madonna. I mean, what a treat. You know, that yeah. was really, really, really a wonderful way to, to spend some time. Yeah. Well, so everyone go get the book. It's out now. Madonna, A Rebel Life by author Mary Gabriel. Mary, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to speak with us about this book and this woman. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really a joy spending the time with you. Tell Thank everyone you. where they can find you on social. Are you on social? I'm not on social. Sorry. Okay. I, okay. I, yeah. I'm, of, I'm of that generation where I, I just can't handle it. I'm still an email person. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. But we also we have to thank Little Brown, your publisher, for um, you know being so gracious and connecting us with you. Also for getting us the book before it was published. And you can follow them at Little Brown on Instagram and send them some love because they they've done a great job with this book. Yeah. They did. Can I just say the cover, which I think is fantastic? The art director Mario um, was absolutely did a beautiful job. That yeah, photo. It's a How beautiful you, photo mean, of her in a, general. And I like it? the way yeah. it's all laid out. It's really, really yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, okay. remember everybody, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and threads at MLVC podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. So you never miss a video at MLVC podcast. We're also on Venmo. If you'd like to drop us a tip, help keep this show going. MLVC podcast. Again, Mary Gabriel. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye. Continued success. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. All right. Hold on. Don't hang up. Okay. I'm going to stop recording.